The one film to own this year There's a mole. is coming to Blu-ray and DVD. He's been there for years. Based on the best-selling novel by John le Carré, it's a spy masterpiece. Things aren't always what they seem. Gary Oldman, Colin Firth, Tom Hardy, Mark Strong. The best film of the year. Now's the time. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Buy it now. Some people always have to have the latest thing. Other people prefer the old-fashioned way. Pity, clunkety, crunch. Me? I like to pick and choose my moments. Mobile boarding passes from American Airlines. Over a billion passengers a year and 19,000 employees, all facing a daily battle with the world's oldest subway system. Welcome to the London Underground. Most of us know what it's like to travel on the tube, but what's it like to work on it? What does it take to keep the system going? It's fabulous how we keep London running. I'm astounded <laughs> most of the time. These are the people who know. But tube workers are worried they'll lose their jobs if they speak publicly. So we've hidden their identities. And their stories are retold word for word by actors. Do you get this thing? There is a good service on blah, blah, blah underground. And as drivers, we know that this is a load of crap. It incenses people because they are being lied to. We call it death by a thousand cuts. Put them all together and you're bleeding the system dry. I think we're just running out of good luck. You worry about one under. We do have a store cupboard where we put the bodies. Tonight we'll tell you things about the London Underground that most passengers will never see. a.m. Um, I'm getting up right in the middle of my sleep patterns. I do that for seven days. I'm completely wrecked. The station opens at quarter past five. We get time to have a cup of coffee. first national trains arrive at about 6.30. And between then and about nine, it's just absolutely manic. It's like a big swarm of fish or a flock of birds all moving in the same direction. Thousands of people to deal with. You have to pretend not there, all those eyes looking at you. Yeah, there have been occasions when I've I felt overwhelmed, and mostly I'm just focusing on that little area just in front of their hands where they've got the ticket. And I look up every now and again, and I see a sea of people all moving this way, but I don't tend to do it very often. It's very nerve-wracking. Uh, if it flows, it's fine. If it doesn't, then it's frightening. London Underground carries more than a billion passengers a year, and the numbers just keep growing. There were 42 million more journeys in 2010 than in the previous year. 
On a day-to-day -day basis, I don't believe that passenger safety is on the mind, but certainly there have been times when it's um, bursting at the seams. There was this one time when it was just me and this other guy, two members of staff uh, trying to deal with 5,000 passengers, all trying to get through this one particular gate line. And you're under pressure, you know, to keep the station open. You're not scared at the time. Uh, I think you're scared later when you come home and, you know, you're lying in bed and you're, you're nervous and shaking. And, uh, yeah, it affects you for, affects you for days. London Underground is undergoing a multi-billion pound upgrade, which includes bigger and more frequent trains. But growing demand is relentless. Despite well-rehearsed crowd control procedures, Pete, who's on the station staff, spoke to us because he believes the system may be reaching breaking point. I think my ultimate fear is that there's going to be too many people down on the platform and um, I'm going to be sat in front of a judge and he's going to be saying, um, how come you let so many people go down there? I mean, there have been times where it's been very, very close, to, I think, to sat and going wrong. The fact that it happens and happens makes me, makes me sound like I'm exaggerating, but it doesn't stop you feeling afraid. And it doesn't stop the passengers coming up to you and telling you that it's dangerous down there. And that happens frequently. Something will happen. It'll be a crash incident. That's my prediction. Throughout the day, station staff like Patricia and Pete are required to provide service updates to passengers. But they've told us that customers aren't getting the whole truth. We have to give a regular service update, but sometimes the um, service annou announcements are wrong. I mean, they'll say there's a good service, but there's someone sat down there on the platform in 35 degrees of heat, uh, waiting for 10 minutes. At stations, you get this thing which says there is a good service on blah, blah, blah underground. And as drivers, we know that this is a load of crap. A good service is defined by the Underground's National Operations Centre, NOC. It is based on average delays across each line. It happens a lot. For example, service is rubbish. There's an incident somewhere. But you see on the station boards, or you hear on the uh, a tannoy connected to the um, NOC, that service is good. <laughs> but you know at your station, service is crap. Well, I think the person on the platform should be making the announcements. I mean, just localised information. But we were told that we can't override the official announcements. Well, we have targets that we have to meet. These people come in, they're called um, mystery shoppers, and uh, they score you if you make these announcements. The station manager doesn't want the official good service message taken down because he's looking at the scores. I mean, he's not looking at the running of the station. Uh, he's looking at the statistics. I mean, the statistics to him are more important. So when I hear officially that the service is a good service, I have to say it's a good service, even if it's not a good service. It makes me feel bad, but I can't tell the customer the truth. Well, I've made a joke of it, you know, when there's a good service message, I've said, uh, not on this station. It's just my way of uh, skirting the system, really, uh, trying to help people. I think most of the staff are like that, you know, they're on your side. Transport for London says... There are no targets for good service announcements. Announcements are driven by a number of key factors, such as gaps in service, suspensions and slow-moving trains. Using the NOC system means staff are under no pressure regarding service information and ensures that information is consistent across the network. 
it incenses people because they are being lied to. They get frustrated and they take it out on the person they can see, me. There's a state of war that exists between the staff and the public. Trains run for 20 hours a day, and with no let-up, the pressures are immense. Signal failures are one of the commonest problems. While passengers are stuck on the platform, behind the scenes, the signal engineer heads to the relay room. The smaller relay rooms weren't really built for the type and amount of equipment that we've got in there. Most are so small that you've, you've got to go in sideways in some places to get to the equipment. Mice come out of everywhere. I've had them all over me, up my arm before. With trains running as often as every two minutes in the peak, the system quickly backs up. Zone 1 customer services assistant Patricia now has to deal with increasing numbers on the platform. You've probably gone from 400 people on a platform to 1,000 plus people on a platform in about three minutes. You're beginning to get worried. You're sweating now. You're making more radio calls. What's going on? Your telephone lights up like a Christmas tree. Everyone's demanding now, now, now. I need an answer from you. You go from dead calm to a perfect storm in some sense. You can't even contact the control room because what's everyone else trying to do? Remember, it's not just my station. He's got 30, 40 stations all ringing. Nobody answering. Nobody answering. He's not answering. He's not picking up. So you can't get any information. The conductors, uh, 100, 110 volts, are, are not covered and open. You've got to use your hands because the latex gloves, they slip when you're undoing a part. I get shocks when I'm working on the line. The 100 volts is, is just a tingle in the fingers. I've gone back and got shocked in the back of the neck. But Ray doesn't bother to report the shocks. Ladies and gentlemen, this train will be coming for a short time before departing. Time is absolutely critical. If you take more than five minutes, it has such a knock-on impact right throughout the line. If the fault's not in the relay room, Ray has to take a train to where he thinks the fault is and get down from the front of the train onto the tracks. He's expected to fix the fault in just five minutes. It's a big drop uh, and you're avoiding grease uh, on, on the rails because if you step on that, you can fall over. The traction current, that 600 volts, is always on. We are trained to work with it on but it can be scary. The Electricity at Work Act states we should have good access, space and lighting. London Underground pushed the regulations to the limits. And then I've got to say, sorry, but you've got to find alternative travel. And I am frightened out of my life. Have you seen how narrow those platforms are? Well, touch wood, we haven't lost anyone yet and no one's fallen down. Transport for London says... The safety of staff is paramount. London Underground is working with an ageing system, but electric shocks in relay rooms are extremely rare, with no recorded instances in the last four years. We work with Her Majesty's Rail Inspectorate to ensure protection and increase training, and we're investing significantly to modernise rooms to improve accessibility. Even when the signal failure is repaired, there's often a knock-on effect into the morning. From 9 to 9.30, the tourists start arriving, and they want to know how to get places, how long it's going to take, what type of tickets they need to get, and that continues for the rest of the day. 
and between that initial period and at the end of the shift, there is no quiet period at all. No quiet period at all. The main part of our job is when something goes wrong. That's when our training comes into force. We are trained to deal with emergencies. Our job is safety critical. I had a man have an epileptic fit on a train. Um, a doctor said not to move the, pa the person that's having a fit. Um, I mean, we all know that. Um, if you work in a Zone 1 uh, station, you, you know, you, you encounter this, this all the time. There's an immense pressure on anyone who's dealing with a train-oriented first aid incident to get that train moving again. You're still on the platform, passengers sticking their heads out, shouting, screaming, swearing at you because they want you to get the man off the train because it's been waiting for seven or eight minutes. Uh, you're under pressure from the line controller because now the line's come to a complete stop. And, um, you know, I agree with him, you know, I agree with them. I mean, I, 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 I want the train to move on. I don't want the man to be having an epileptic fit, but, you know, I mean, I, I can't override what's actually going on. If the doctor says don't move him, you've got a bit of a dilemma because what that doctor or nurse is thinking about is that individual, that patient, but you can't just think about that individual. You see, the longer that train's in the platform, the longer someone's stuck on the train behind, and then you just compound the problems. While the number of passengers keeps on increasing, the number of frontline staff has decreased. In the last two years, almost 800 station staff and managerial jobs have been cut from the 260 stations across the network. Many are from frontline posts in central London. David on the station staff told us he sometimes finds it hard to cope. It's curious, as soon as people get into an underground station, they all, I know, they lose some of their normal social habits, their inhibitions, and their, they become very difficult. I mean, someone swears at me every day, you know, uh, this is a shit service, um, you, you grey old git, you grey old twat, you know, get it all. Yeah, pretty bad. <laughs> uh, I think even Mother Teresa will lose her rag on the gate line. <laughs> Just when you get your goodwill thrown back at you, you know, you've had five consecutive insults, and it, it, it's hard to be good to the next person, the sixth person, you know? The person that's in your hoodie, uh, not wanting to be noticed, uh, won't bother you at all. The worst is your man in his 30s, in a suit, white, They'll give you grief, and if they're drunk, they're worse. Worse than football fans, actually. This uh, pack mentality develops very quickly, and you know, you're just one person. So if, if, you're the, if you're a little fox and there's a pack of hounds around you, it's not a very nice feeling. You know what I mean? You almost feel like running away. Well, I've experienced the military. Um, I find the underground more frightening than the army, because you've got nothing to defend yourself with, you know. At least in the army you've got a rifle or something. I've been followed before, you know, followed to where I'm going to hide, to the safe room. It's, it's, it can be pretty scary down there. There were two guys that had been drinking and they didn't have enough money on their oyster card. That was my fault, apparently. Well, his ticket wasn't valid. Um, what do you mean my ticket's not valid? You know, and they've got their face like right up into your face. Um, you can feel and smell their breath on your skin, and they're screaming at you, swearing at you. They were being really abusive, they're kind of threatening, they kind of come around and get you. You know, I was saying this, there's no need for this. And then um, I'm slapped by the customer in the face, you know, poked in the chest. I was really traumatised by it. Um, we called the police, and it took five men just to pin one guy down and arrest him. I was really scared because it was so aggressive. Pete and Patricia's experiences are part of a recently growing trend. London Underground reports that violent incidents in 2010-2011 were up by nearly 20%, and threats to staff were up by 44%. Well, when I first started, I really didn't feel overwhelmed because we were working in twos and threes. Um, but most of the time, I find I'm working by myself now. I think we're seriously understaffed. It can leave you feeling 
I'll be vulnerable. It's not just frontline workers who are concerned about staffing. We know that one senior manager has described Whitechapel Station as grievously understaffed. And at Tower Hill, staff were on the verge of being overwhelmed. I think there's been an, an increase in assaults on members of staff like myself because, uh, well, we're so few of us and there's so many more passengers. Between January and July, I've been assaulted twice. Uh, I would say that I feel my safety has decreased by a third in the last seven months. Transport for London says... We take violence against staff very seriously. We work closely with British Transport Police and seek the strongest possible penalties for those guilty of such abuse. All stations are adequately staffed and retaining high safety standards remains a top priority. There are two types of pressure that I feel. One um, from the customers and the other type of pressure is from the top down. So the, from the management who's got to keep the service running at all costs. As for customer safety, the Office of Rail Regulation reported last July that the underground is safer than the European average. However, the report also said there were a number of notable and worrying near misses on London Underground last year. Tube workers have expressed concerns about occasions when they felt safety came second to keeping the system running. It's a fingers crossed attitude. We're just running on good luck. In one case, the luck ran out. We've learned that a decision to reopen a station, despite safety questions, contributed to a major emergency operation. This is from an official London Underground report. 9.25, station supervisor reports that he can barely see the end of the corridor. It appears to be masses of dust. 9.34, station evacuated. In May last year, Charing Cross Station was evacuated after an inexplicable cloud suddenly engulfed passengers walking through the station. The London Fire Brigade reported there was no fire and the all clear was given. But we cannot reopen immediately as uh, we have masses of dust in the atmosphere and it is caked all over the floor. 10.51, the mopping and the dusting is finished. 11.11, .11, the station is open to the public and trains can stop normally. We've been told that staff felt pressure to reopen the station to the public even though the cause of the dust cloud remained unknown. Half an hour later, their concerns were justified. At 11.48, the fire panel activates another message. Station supervisor radios back that there has been a reoccurrence of the dust clouds. This time, an engineer working in the area reported hearing a massive thud just before the clouds of dust billowed down the passage. Station supervisor reports that the fire doors have experienced such force, presumably either from slamming together or from extreme air pressure while closed, that they have buckled so it appears there is at least one part of this phenomenon that we have not understood completely. The station was evacuated and the London Fire Brigade and Ambulance Services sent seven vehicles to the scene. Luckily, no one was injured. Customer service assistant is concerned about asbestos. Station supervisor feeling a bit nauseous and also suffered from headaches, itchy eyes, cramps and sore throat. He is stripped and washed down with a saline solution and his clothes are bagged up by the ambulance staff and taken to hospital. That's the end of the report. An air quality test confirmed that asbestos levels in the air were negligible, but no one knew this when the station reopened, as the test was performed five hours later. We've learned that station staff are angry that passengers were unnecessarily exposed to these dust clouds. At no point during the Charing Cross incident were any staff or customers in danger. Recommendations have been made to ensure engineering and operational responses to incidents are further improved. Safety is always a concern. It's, the tube is just one of those systems where you feel potentially at any moment it could just go spinning off into chaos.
that nationwide, when we say we're on your side, we're not just saying it. That's why we'll give you free European travel insurance if you switch to the nationwide current account with no monthly fee and pay in at least £750 a month. For more information on our no monthly fee current account, go to nationwide.co.uk. Nationwide. On your side. Nothing compares with water. Natural, pure, and refreshing. Discover a new kind of personal hygiene with Geberit AquaClean, the WC that cleans you with water. Find out more at ilovewater.co.uk. Changes again at four o'clock, the commuters start coming back, and it's exceptionally busy. Since 2003, the reliability of the London Underground has gradually improved. However, 2010-2011 saw a 20% increase in delays across the network. Line controllers such as Dan are responsible for managing problems and are acutely aware of public demand to speed up the service. You read in the papers all the time, there's passengers stuck here, there's passengers stuck there. The mayor's got his backside due to speed things up. With increased passenger demand expected during the Olympics, London Underground has promised to return delays to record low levels. In my view, we might be speeding things up a bit too much. We've gone from the safety view to the speeding things up view. Over the past few years, there's been a number of official changes to procedures designed to speed up the service. Dan and other staff have expressed their concerns about a range of small changes to the way things are expected to be done. When these are added together, the fear is they could impact on customer safety. One in particular that concerns my colleagues and me is to do with the platform where people stand for the train. Platform train interface is what the underground called a top risk event. I mean, that's the main area where you're going to get accidents. There was someone at Holborn, a boy, had the straps of his jacket, a cagoul type, whatever, stuck in the doors. He ended up being dragged to his death. As a driver, there are two things you worry about. One is a one under, which is obviously when someone jumps under the train. Uh, the other thing is you don't want to drag a kid to their death. In the old days, you used to have a guard. Remember guards? They were great. And they'd look down the train, make sure everyone was safe, uh, give the driver uh, indications, you know, all clear, you can go. So they got rid of the guards and bought in mirrors and monitors. If a monitor fails or whatever, then you would have what is called an assisted dispatch. And that means a member of the station staff comes down and they give you assistance to dispatch. In 2001, London Underground introduced dedicated staff to help on the busiest platforms. But recent changes to official procedures make it more common for drivers to leave stations without help even if their mirrors and monitors are defective. So now they get their drivers to get out of their seat, have a look along the platform, if it's clear, go back, shut their doors, do one final check and drive off. It's called self-dispatch and obviously it's less safe because anything could have happened since the last time you looked down the train. I mean, you know, a kid could have fallen down the gap. Staff are also concerned about London Underground proposals they've seen for the future. They've even decided in some stations 
where you can't see the whole platform from the train, the drivers actually leave the cab, walk along the platform and have a look. Leaving the cab was introduced some years ago on a few stations. And in a document from 2010, London Underground made the case for extending this procedure to some other stations. It makes my life easier. The delay on the line is reduced, get the trains moving quicker, so I can put my feet up and read the paper. But it's not as safe. London Underground's plan noted that leaving the cab is less safe, but anticipated the risk of extending the procedure to be low and balanced it against the hazards associated with passengers being stuck in a tunnel while drivers wait for help. What's drummed into you when you're training is safety. There's an old adage which is uh, that the rule book's written in blood. Um, the problem we've got is that senior management are kind of trying to tweak and erode some of the standards we've all worked to. In the last accounting year, over a hundred people fell down the gap between the train and the platform. These incidents are rare, but the overall number of incidents involving the platform and the train is increasing year on year. It is unlikely to happen, but the reason it doesn't happen is because we've got safety rules. Once you start shaving away at the safety wedge, eventually you're going to shave too far. Something's going to give. I'd rather do my job properly, you know, and not have someone's injury on my conscience. I want to do things properly. If I wanted to be dodgy, I would have joined a bank. Recent changes to procedures will significantly help our response to incidents, reducing unnecessary delays and crowding while improving customer service. On a handful of stations not managed by London Underground, London Underground drivers can be required to leave the cab when necessary. No self-dispatch rules compromise any aspect of the Underground's stringent safety procedures. Parts of the London Underground date back to the 1860s, and despite billions of pounds of investment, we've spoken to a number of staff who are concerned about the state of the tracks. If you're having a cup of tea on a train and it ends up shooting up your nose, it's probably because there's a, a dip joint there where you've got two ends of a rail with voids underneath. Every single day you notice that the train is having a rough ride through certain sections. And it's scary. I mean, the train is jumping around all over the place. Steve, a driver, spoke to us because he's worried about the backlog of track repairs. We have one or two guys who are really good at spotting faults. What drivers tend to do, especially the older ones, is when they go over a track, if they hear a, a change in the noise or there's a bang or something, the next time round they go slow over that area to see what the problem is. Dennis is in track maintenance. He explained how London Underground keeps the track in shape. We patrol the lookout for any faults that need to be rectified. Then we fill out this patrol sheet and put down what needs to be done. When I first started, we had a big gang. If we have more staff, we get a lot more work done and a lot quicker. Well, you see things like um, eight defective timbers, sleepers, which is about 15 to 20 foot of track, which isn't up to standard. So you would expect it to be something that would be done right away. Well, the one I'm looking at was reported in June last year, and it still hasn't been done in February of this year. I can't believe you've got eight defective timbers on here. I mean, presumably one was defective before two was defective. So it must be easier to do one than it is to do all eight in one go. It's been tanked, what we call tank, which is temporary proof non-compliance. Basically, a load of gobbledygook for someone has been down and said, yeah, that'll be all right for a little while longer. Why would a company allow that area to be used? I mean, why aren't you fixing those areas? Well, May last year we had an engineering train, which is quite a heavy unit, coming through to Earl's Court. When the track underneath it just spread, I mean, the train actually derailed and hit the wall. The Department for Transport's Rail Accident Investigation Branch found that the Earl's Court derailment of 2010 was due to a number of factors. Non-identification and misclassification of track faults, which led to those faults not being rectified. 
insufficient staff to maintain the track, and the failure to identify safety risks from combined groups of less serious faults. The RAIB report is very specific on the faults. You've got bouncing tracks moving left to right and bits which hold the rail down onto the sleeper for close to 1,200 days not being fixed. Since the derailment, things have improved. The walks have shortened and we've got enough time. And they've given us more contractors to do repairs. You know, I'm a little bit more confident. But we still have to write down what needs to be done. And it doesn't get done. It's reactive rather than proactive. I mean, it, it still isn't that clever. It still isn't that good or smooth a track. I think derailments are a worry for every single driver, every single day. A few years ago, I would have put money on it happening between Barrow's Court and Acton Town, but now I would imagine it happening somewhere within the tunnel. You get on the train, you hope you get off the train. You're thankful. Uh, you know, for us, it's a matter of fingers crossed and hope for the best. To cut running costs, London Underground has set a target to reduce maintenance expenditure by almost a billion pounds over the next six years through a range of measures. They want to change petroleum from twice a week to once a week. I don't think it's safe. I don't think it will be safe at all. Because anything can happen. A joint or a broken plate won't be patrolled again for another six or seven days. And a lot can happen. There are more major overhauls going on, which is great, but the little minor jobs don't happen anymore. Everything which is moving needs to be maintained regardless. That's not saying it's falling below the safety standard, but it's probably not as good as it should be. In August last year, maintenance schedules did change on one line. Many patrols on the Piccadilly line changed from twice a week to only once. London Underground is also considering reducing maintenance for signalling equipment and trains. Train stops, that's the automatic train protection that, that stops the train. We maintain that every 12 weeks. They want to knock that to every 24 weeks, if not 26. We see it as dangerous. It's one of the main safety features within the signalling system on the railway today. It's a safety issue for the travelling public. We describe it as death by a thousand cuts. You don't see the first little cut and you don't see the last little cut. But put them all together and you're bleeding the system dry. All track is maintained to exacting standards which are the highest in the rail industry. Priority is given to rails in the poorest condition and when repair timescales cannot be achieved, mitigating measures can be applied using the tank process, such as restricting speed and frequency of trains over a section of track to extend its working life. London Underground has lengthened basic inspection frequencies on new track, which requires far less maintenance. In the front of a train, you're on your own, and it's like, a, like an isolation tank. Uh, no distractions, no one. Well, there's not much you can do to combat the boredom. You've got to stay alert. You can't listen to music or read a newspaper or a book. You're staring at your customers on the monitors, trying not to get people caught in the door. But I do enjoy the job, the responsibility, the fact that I'm in charge. I enjoy providing public service. When you're coming into a platform, there are all sorts of incidents with passengers. Kids with their legs over the platform, people pretending to throw their mates under the train. And you get that all the time, every day. And you get really scared. thing that happened some years ago I caught a passenger under the train he 
you get to know the signs. They take the wedding rings off or they stand there peering out, acting erratically. And you're you know, blowing your whistle and putting your brakes on and you think, go on, turn around. Once one of my colleagues wrestled someone to the ground because he knew he was going to jump. It wasn't my fault I ended somebody's life, but I ended somebody's life. It does it you odd. Around 50 people attempt suicide on the London Underground every year, one a week. Chinner works in the emergency response unit, which is on call day and night. As far as I understand it, London Ambulance Services have limited resources. And a few years back, they stopped taking anybody who's deceased into the ambulances back to hospitals. So it's down to the coroner. Sometimes there's a delay. It might be half an hour, maybe even two hours. And then we're left with a body and platform. And disturbingly for us, we have to find a place to put a body. Unfortunately, we had to use a Stratford uh, bin store outside in the car park, you know, the big, massive industrial bins. Put in someone's body in there, not in the bin, in with the bins. It's not really respectful. However, do I keep the station shut until the coroner and his guys gets there and inconvenience the rest of London? I know that we've got a store cupboard that we put the bodies in and there is one station supervisor who will not go in that cupboard at all. We've even heard of, of situations where cleaners come down to get a mop or a bucket or whatever and there's some poor unfortunate person's body in there. Uh, absolutely disgusting. I mean, it, it, I, I think it shows the uh, deepest disrespect. Um, myself, um, somebody's child, mother, we want to provide that person with as much dignity as we can, but it's a system that's been in place for a few years now. I mean, there's, there's nothing we can do about it. I don't really see a solution to the problem. Following agreed procedures, a body may be moved to a secure room within the station to await collection by undertakers. We believe our staff do a fantastic job in responding to such difficult circumstances and they are offered counselling support if necessary. Yeah, well, the show must go on and, you know, there's a relevance to that. But also I think decencies have to be observed when things like this happen. And I sometimes think that if you forget who the dead are, then you're not really sure who, who you are as the living. changes again at about 7, between 7 to 10, 11.30. That's all the people that have been out for the evening. Staff have repeatedly spoken to us about the unrelenting pressure to keep the system running. Station supervisor Rosemary told us that this pressure has even meant that UK safety regulations have been broken. It's a legal requirement to maintain the minimum number of staff at a station. For my station, it's two people. Two people all the time. It's the law. If I've not got the number of staff, I have to close the station. These rules are part of our national fire regulations and were brought in to improve safety in the underground after the King's Cross fire, which killed 31 passengers and staff. The service manager pressured me to keep the station open below minimum numbers, but I didn't bow down for them. I said, are you asking me or are you telling me? He soon backed off. It's an inconvenience for the passengers and it's an inconvenience for the management to close the station. They're targeted, so closing the station has an effect on their points. You can please management, but if anything goes wrong, your job is at risk. A couple of months ago, one of my colleagues, 
uh, station supervisor kept the station open below the number. It's illegal. He just listened to the manager and kept the station open until my other colleague arrived. Only one person kept the station open for more than half an hour. It's documented in the station logbook. Everything now is about the service. I mean, it doesn't matter what else is happening. The world could be falling apart, but as long as that service is running around you, then the managers are happy. London Underground staff stations at all times when services are running. On two specific occasions, errors by employees have led to stations remaining in operation while not staffed at the levels London Underground demands. Immediate inquiries led to clarification of operational guidelines and increased training. Angry is not the word. We're more frustrated and worried about what the future will hold for the underground. The final flurry round about 11 o'clock, 11.30, when the theatres finish their last shows and the pubs tip out, it's exhausting. Officially, we're allowed a meal break, and for the rest of our eight-hour shift, we are standing on our feet. When I get home, I am very, very tired. So when you get in the last tube home, sometimes you see the engineering trains go past. I mean, all these people disappearing into the night, hundreds of them, unsung heroes. Best part of my job, uh, going home. At the end of the day, when everybody gets off the train OK, and occasionally you are getting customers coming around and actually saying thank you. I think it's absolutely marvellous, the transport system that we have, you know. I mean, you've got old decaying bits with, with new bits added on. You've got old signalling systems with new signalling systems added on. We've got tracks and tunnels built in the 60s with modern trains going through them. I think it's, it's fabulous how we keep London running. I'm astounded <laughs> most of the time. People do write in and that does make a big difference. I've been bought cups of coffee, I've even been given a rose. And yes, it was for a drunk man, but that still counts. <laughs> you do go home and your head's absolutely drumming. It's a very wearing job, but you know, I couldn't do anything without my colleagues. The people I work with on the underground are first rate. I feel a sense of pride that the underground carries three and a half million people a day. Um, I know what I do is good, we do a good job, but we are pushed to the limit. We've got decades of experience of how to run the railway safely, but what they're doing obviously is just cutting away at that. Um, the memory of how to run a safe railway has been kind of undermined. I believe that the people on the ground, the people that have served on the stations, on the track, on the railway for 20 odd years, will do just what has to be done, do the right thing in terms of what's going to be safe. I hope. <laughs>